Our Easter weekend is going to be a fantastic week. I know it's going to be real busy. And yes, there are a lot of signups because we need a lot of people involved in the many different areas. But we'll be kicking off on Thursday night of Easter week with a, a, a catered dinner here in the sanctuary. You're going to have to sign up for it. And we only take about 400 people. Uh, but first come, first serve. But we'll start out with a meal covenant uh, on that night as we kick off Easter weekend. It'll be a very special night. You don't want to miss it. And then Friday night will be our Good Friday service. I brought a gift back from Israel for everybody who attends the Friday night Good Friday service. Uh, and it's not the communion cups that I brought you last year. Okay, it's different. Uh, and then we have our Saturday night service. And then uh, Sunday, oh, Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, we have a tent that we're putting up out here on the field on the other side of the sanctuary where we'll have an Easter sunrise service at 7.30 a.m. Uh, and then our regular 9 a.m., 10.20, 11.45, and 5 p.m. So there are going to be tons of opportunity to be able to get people here on Easter weekend. I hope you're... Uh, you're able to be a part of most of it. It's going to be a fantastic Easter week as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we need your help. It's going to take a lot of people serving in different areas, but thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you for your willingness to be a part. Uh, is that Riley Brandon back there? Riley, welcome home, girl. It's good to see you. Riley's all the way back from Australia. I heard you were back. I was wondering when you're going to show up. Yeah, I've been looking for you. It's good to see you. Good to see you and your crew there. Thank you, the Brandon family. Uh, hey, last week I started this series of messages called Dealing with Disappointment because we all face disappointment at different times in our life. Just because we serve God, because we become a follower of Christ, doesn't mean that we don't face difficulties or disappointments in life. Last week I talked to you about how to deal with the disappointment of unanswered prayer. And we had to look at why there are unanswered prayers in our lives. Sometimes we don't recognize the prayer. Sometimes we don't like the prayer uh, or the way the prayer has answered. Uh, God has answered. Sometimes uh, we keep waiting on a yes when God's already said no. There's many different reasons why, and we talked about how to deal with that disappointment. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how to deal with the disappointment of why do bad things happen to good people. And it's crazy. Now, some of you may already be settled with this, but it's amazing to me how every time there is a tragedy in our country, Every time there's another mass shooting, every time there's a, a, an innocent life that is taken, every time something that seems so unjust happens uh, in our world, the question arises, why do bad things happen to good people? Where was God when this was happening? And so I'm going to deal with this today on why bad things happen to good people. And you, you're going to need to know these things because somebody's going to ask you. The question is going to come up again. When an innocent life is taken or a tragedy strikes, somebody's going to ask, why do bad things happen? And you're going to need to be able to answer them properly. So we looked at the life of Job, starting in Job chapter 1 last week. We're going to be in Job chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse number 1. And it starts out almost the same way Job chapter 1 did. Job chapter 2, verse number 1 says, On another day the angel came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came with him to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on the earth like him. He's blameless, upright, a man who fears God, shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Remember, Satan wanted permission to be able to attack all that he had. He took care of all of his possessions, even his children. But yet he still remained faithful to God. Verse four, skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones. He will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he's in your hands, but you must spare his life. So, so, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And then he took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Job was in so much pain with the sores that were upon his body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He would take a piece of broken pottery and would scrape the sores trying to relieve the pain. He was in so much pain. His wife said to him, verse number nine, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. 
shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Now notice that. Job asks a question that gives us the, the understanding that even Job realized you don't just accept the good from God. Sometimes you've got to accept the bad. And it's not that God creates bad, but God will use difficult, trying circumstances in our life for our good if we will allow him. Now, the Bible tells us that the righteous man falls seven times, but that man gets up again. Bad things are going to happen to good people, but don't give up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't stop. Keep moving forward. But it still doesn't answer the question of why do bad things happen to good people? And I know this question has been asked for ages uh, and there's not just one answer that satisfies, but there are many answers that could be the reason. And I'm going to give you those many answers that could be the reason. And you'll have to figure out which one fits for you. So let's get right to it. Bad things happen to good people. Number one, because you've sinned. That's the one we like to go to. Oh, there must be sin in your life. Uh, well, it could be true. Not necessarily always, but it could be true. We know it's the life. It's what happened in the life of Jonah. Whenever Jonah was commanded by God to go to the city of Nineveh and preach against the sin, and uh, Jonah didn't want to go there. He didn't think that those people deserved to hear about the goodness of God, so he refused. He rebelled. He went a different direction, jumped on a ship, headed the opposite direction. God sent a storm. Uh, they threw Jonah into the water. The fish, the well, swallowed him, spit him out on the shores of Nineveh. He preached the gospel. All that happened, why? Because of Jonah's sin. So we know that it happened uh, to Jonah because of his sin, but that's not always the case because in John chapter nine, verses one and three, it says, as he went along, he saw a blind man from birth and look what the disciples immediately assumed. Rabbi, who sinned that this man, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They just assumed that a, this bad thing that happened, a man was blind, somebody had to have sinned. But what did Jesus say? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So yes, sin can be a reason why bad things happen, but it's not always the reason. We see this in the case here with Jesus and his disciples. But there's another reason. The next reason why bad things happen to good people could be because somebody else sinned. We could stay there for a while, right? Let's get off of us. Let's, somebody else has sinned. But think of the case of Jonah again. Jonah jumps on that ship and starts set, sailing the opposite direction. And because of his sin, what happens? He, put it, he puts everybody else in jeopardy. The, sh the storm came and almost took them all under. Why? Because of Jonah's sin. So everybody, in fact, look at verse number five. All the sailors were afraid. The Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm broke... Uh, that the ship threatened to break, and all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. So bad things happened to them because somebody else had sinned. Uh, I've introduced a very good friend of mine to you before, Gabriel Nahara, who was born with no arms, and his feet were uh, uh, twisted, and he literally walks on the top of his feet. Uh, Gabriel was born in Mexico, but when he was born in Mexico, because he was so physically deformed, the community believed that somebody had sinned. Uh, they believed that his parents must have sinned. They must have done something wrong for him to have been born uh, with such deformity because that was just the culture that they lived in. And I know many people believe that, that if something bad happened, it's because somebody has sinned. It can be the case, but it's not always the case. The next reason why bad things happen to good people is number three, because you've simply been targeted by Satan. You've been targeted by Satan. First Peter five, verse number eight says this, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. See, this is why you have to be on guard. You've got to be watchful. You've got to be prayerful. Yes. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, but you're going to have to fight. And every one of us know we know who the enemy targets the most. It's the one who's been isolated, the one who's been separated, the one who is away from everybody, the one who has allowed offense or hurt or something else to separate them from the pack. 
And that's exactly the way Satan wants to target you. He finds somebody who's allowed a fence to settle inside of their heart and they're starting to miss church or they're separating themselves from their small group. They're separating themselves from their friends. And all of a sudden you're alone, you're isolated and the enemy targets you and he comes at you. Well, that's why the enemy has put a target upon your back because you've separated yourself from the pack. It is so important that we stay committed to the body of Christ. We stay committed to the family of God. We stay accountable to one to another. Why? We're safeguarding one another from the enemy's attack. Don't let the enemy separate you from the body of Christ. The next reason why bad things happen to good people could be number four, because God is testing and perfecting you. I know some right now are thinking, I don't need any testing. I don't need any perfecting. I'm fine just the way I am. But here, look at what the scripture says in James 1, 2, and 4. It says, consider it pure joy, brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. It produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So it's the testing of your faith that develops the perseverance. And then when the perseverance finishes its work, it makes you mature and complete. In other words, we can't get to maturity. We can't get to completion until we're tested. So there has to be a testing. There has to be some type of adversity that we face in our lives in order to get us complete and mature. In the same way that our muscles have to be tested, they have to be stretched in order for them to become fully developed. Sometimes God allows tests in our lives to fully develop us. Nobody here in our right mind wants to remain an immature baby Christian. We want to grow up in our faith, right? But we would rather grow up in our faith without the testing, without the growing pains. But you can't get there without the growing pains. There's going to have to be the testing. There's going to have to be the, the uncomfortable season, the painful process. And if you just allow yourself to get through that painful process, watch God develop you into something beautiful. Here, number five, the next reason why bad things happen to good people could be number five. Because God's protecting you. He's protecting you. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes... God allows bad things to happen to us to protect us from ourselves. Do you realize sometimes God will allow your plan, the bottom to fall out of your plans just so that he can protect you from pursuing that plan? Because we get so hell bent on going after certain things every now and then that nothing's going to stop us. I mean, it, it, it might take Jesus incarnate to come and stand in front of us and speak to us to get us to let go of it. But no, no, we'll just keep on pushing. We'll keep on pushing. We're so determined. And sometimes God will let the bottom fall out of it just to protect us from pursuing those plans. See, he's got something better in store for you. He's got something better uh, for each and every one of us. And sometimes he'll allow our plans to fall apart so that he can get his plan into our lives. Next reason why bad things happen to good people. Number six is because God's making you stronger. He's simply making you stronger. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, here's what the apostle Paul said again. He said, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Now I got to tell you, I've never met anybody who talks like this. I've never met anybody who said, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults. I delight in hardships. I delight in persecution. I delight in difficulties. But the apostle Paul did. And he said, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What was he saying? He said, I I like these difficult things because they make me dependent upon God. When I can't do it on my own, it makes me depend upon God. And then when I depend upon God, I'm stronger. Because God always comes through better than I can for myself. 
So we have to learn to rely upon him. And sometimes God allows difficulties in our lives because that's the only thing that will keep us dependent upon him. It's amazing how easy it is to seek after God and go after God when things are going bad. And it's amazing how easy it is to slip back into just being complacent and lazy spiritually when everything's going good. But you let lose our job and what? What's the first thing we do? We call a prayer chain. <laughs> call grandma. Why we want prayer warriors praying. We show up at church. We're in the altar. We sign up for a 24-hour prayer slot. Yeah, we, we do all kinds of stuff whenever bad things happen. But then when things are going good, it's really easy to get uh, a little complacent. Look, sometimes God wants to make you stronger. So he allows things to happen in our lives in order to make us more dependent upon him. Number seven. <coughs> Here's the, the, the next reason why bad things happen to good people. It could be this, because God's setting you up for something greater. God's simply setting you up for something greater. Somebody just needs to hold on to this, receive this, because you, you need to hear this. In fact, we studied the story of Joseph uh, in the month of January during our 25,000 mornings. You're going through that in the life groups right now. But Joseph, a favorite son of his father, Jacob, hated by his brothers, was, his death was faked and he was sold into slavery and he ends up in prison and uh, then ends up through a series of events second in command over all of Egypt. A famine hits the land and Joseph's brothers have to come to buy food from him. And in Genesis 45, verse number four, it says, then Joseph said to his brothers, come, to, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Now, do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Isn't that crazy? 13 years of pain and trial and torment that Joseph went through and he could say, it was God who did it. It was God who allowed these things to happen, the saving of many lives. And at the end of the day, every one of us have to realize our lives belong to God. We belong to him. It's not up to us. Look, look, the goal of the Christian life is not convenience and comfort. Somebody hear me. The goal of the Christian life is not to be the most comfortable life that we can have and the most convenient life. No, it's to do the will of the Father, even if that means tough times. It's to follow the pathway of Jesus Christ, even if it means walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It means doing what he has called us to do and commanded us to do, even if it requires our own life. Oh, y'all got a little quiet, quiet then. Y'all yeah, yeah, on a little amen roll until I got there. But isn't it true? We've either committed our lives to him or not. Regardless of whether good times or bad times come, we have to be willing to surrender to him no matter what. And here's Joseph. He realizes that all of the pain that he went through, even at the hands of his siblings, was ultimately not their fault. God used it to fulfill his purpose. Genesis 50, verse number 20 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Yeah, Joseph experienced some very bad things, but God used all of it to set him up for something greater. And here's the last thing. The last reason why bad things happen to good people, it could be because of no explainable reason whatsoever. That should cover everything that I didn't get to, right? No explainable reason. Why? Because Matthew 5, 45 says, he causes the sun to rise on evil and good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That doesn't make sense. Sometimes we just have to understand that sometimes we're going to understand what God does and sometimes we're not. 
Sometimes it's going to make sense. Sometimes it's not. But we're going to keep trusting him no matter what. I mean, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. With that being the case, I don't assume that we'll ever be able to understand everything that God does or why he allows certain things in our life. But this is what I know, that when bad things happen, I'm going to keep trusting him. I'm going to keep standing upon the promise of God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean upon your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will continue to make your path straight. See, the bottom line is that bad things happen to all people. To all people. And God has given every single one of us. Listen to this. Don't miss this. God has given every single one of us a free will to choose. Here's the problem. We want our free will to choose, but we still want God to protect us from our bad free will choices. You can't have it both ways. Because there are consequences to our choices. God didn't promise to keep bad things from happening to us, but he promised to keep you when bad things happen. Somebody needs to hear that. He didn't promise to keep bad things from happening to us, to make our life just always good and always fun and always pain-free. No, but he promised to keep us when bad things do happen. Jesus said, in this world, you would have trouble. But he said, in me, you would have peace. And there's a peace that completely blows our minds away if we will just put our hope and our trust in Christ. Why bad things happen to good people is not really the right question. The question is, what do we do when bad things happen? We keep trusting Jesus. We keep trusting Jesus. We keep trusting Jesus because he's trustworthy. And he will wrap his arms around you and he will walk with you through the fire. Where's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Find Jesus right in the middle of the fire. Where Daniel finds Jesus right there in the middle of the lion's den. He will be with you through the fire. He'll be with you through the flood. He'll be with you through your loneliness. He'll be with you through your pain. He'll be with you through your good days and your bad days. He's a good, good father. I remember when I was sharing Christ with somebody and she asked me the question. She said, well, if you can answer this question for me, then you can tell me about Jesus. Why do bad things happen to good people? She said, because I'm a parent. I never let anything bad happen to my kids. I said, oh, you would. I said, has anything bad ever happened to your kids? Well, I said, have they ever fallen down and gotten hurt? Somebody ever bullied them, pushed them around? I said, you couldn't stop all that from happening, could you? She said, well, no. I said, what did you do when it happened, though? She says, I held them. I held them. I loved them. I restored them. That's what God does for us. He may not keep every bad thing from happening to us in our lives. He can't do that. But he will be there with us when a bad thing does happen. And he will walk with you every step of the way. Would you do me a favor and stand to your feet? Father, I thank you. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your care and your love for us. I thank you that you are so close to us, even right here, right now. That those who are in this room today that feel the pain of trials and hardships and difficulties that have come their way, their mind cannot comprehend what's going on, their heart's hurting because of all of the things they're having to walk through. Lord, they realize today 
They've got to put their trust in someone who's able to hold them until this storm subsides. To speak peace in the midst of this storm. And I declare right now that your peace is raining down from heaven above and it's filling the hearts of hurting people and it's touching people right where they need to be touched today. I believe that hope is being restored. New life is being birthed. That God, you're doing something new in each and every heart today. For those that are in this room right now and those that are watching online, God, I know that there are many that are facing some of the most difficult days of their life. But God, you have not left them. You have not forsaken them. You have not walked out on them. You have walked in to their circumstance today. You've walked into the midst of their storm and you're with them right now. Your head's bowed all over this place. How many would say, Kendall? Man, I'm facing one of the most impossible situations. Insurmountable odds. To call it a bad thing is almost an understatement. It's an attack and it's assault. It's, it's, a, it's, it's more than I can handle. It's a mountain of mammoth proportion. I needed this today, but I need to put my hope and my trust in God. I need to put my hope and a trust in a God that's able to see me through this, to pull me through this, to get me through this. Say that this is... You're talking to me right now. I want you to slip up your hand. Just hold it up high right now all over this place. Hold it up high. Yeah, 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 yeah. Reach hand. Reach over and take the hand of somebody next to you right now. Come on, just take them by the hand. All across this room, just take them by the hand. There are hands that went up all over this place. Just take them by the hand. We're going to pray for one another. We're going to speak life. We're going to speak peace. We're going to speak help. We're going to speak hope. We're going to speak like the children of God that we know we are. And I want you to speak to, into that situation, right? You don't even have to know what it is. You just have to know that there are hands all over this place. And somebody that you're holding hands with right now is facing an impossible situation that they can't get through on their own. They need the help of God. Let's call it in right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that all over this room, all over this room, as people are li- have lifted up their hands and said, God, I'm facing an impossibility today. I declare in the name of Jesus, you would begin to rain down from heaven the peace of God that passes all understanding. May the peace of God come and fill our hearts right now. Lord, we know that in this world we'll have trouble, but in you we have peace. And I'm, I'm declaring peace for every one of my brothers and sisters today. I'm declaring peace in the name of Jesus. I declare peace. For every family, or those that are walking through impossibilities in their marriages, and those that are walking through impossibilities physically, they've received that doctor's report. I declare in the name of Jesus, healing is coming. Healing is flowing into your life and into your family right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the one who is facing financial ruin. God, you are the one who is able to turn it around to work it all together for good. I trust you and I believe you to do that right now. Lord, I thank you. You are a faithful God. Lord, those that are battling with whether they have been the right parents, their kids are not serving you. They're wondering, Lord, what what did they do wrong? God, help them to know there's nothing we can do about the past, but today we can start making a difference right now. Let their prayers be heard from on high. And you begin to bring back those prodigals. Bring them back in the name of Jesus. We call sons and daughters home in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Thank you. You are a faithful God. You're faithful to hear our prayers and to answer our prayers even here right now. We trust you and we believe you to do it today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now do me a favor. Just slip your hands up to the Lord all over this place. Just say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I may not understand everything that's happening in my life, but I trust you. I may not know why things are happening in my life, but I trust you.
Lord, I put my trust in you. I don't lean on my own understanding, but in all my ways, I acknowledge you. Lord, I know you will direct my path. I trust you. I trust you. Lord, with our hands lifted up all over this room, we declare our trust in a God who is able to do more than we can ask or think. We put our trust in a God who cares more than we can comprehend. We trust you, God. We trust you today. Thank you, Jesus. You're a faithful God. You're a good father. We put our hope and our trust in you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. Just bow your heads one more time, just for a moment. All over this room, if you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've never put your hope and you've never put your faith in Christ, I challenge you to trust him today. You can continue to try to make your way through life and try to find answers and find, find solutions and find something to fill the void in your life. The only thing that will ever do that is Jesus Christ. God created you. There's a place inside of you that only he can fill. Nothing else can fill that emptiness except Jesus. Let him in right now. You say, I'm ready to put my trust in Christ, Kendall. I'm ready to put my hope in Jesus. I'm ready to trust him. Maybe you've never responded to Christ before. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Or maybe you have, but you find yourself away from him. Listen, today is the day to come back to Jesus. Today is the day. If you're here and say, Kendall, would you pray for me? I'm ready to put my hope and my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want you to slip your hand up. Just hold it up high right now. Say, pray for me. Man, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else just say, pray for me. Man, thank you. Man, God sees every single hand, and even those watching online right now. Father, I pray for each and every person in this room today that has said, I'm ready to put my trust in Christ. You said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So right there where you are, I want you to say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. I confess my sins. I confess my life. I confess you as my Lord. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap right now. Now listen, here's what I want you to do. Just before we're dismissed and we get out of here today, if you made a decision to follow Christ, or even if you've made that decision before and uh, you've never made an opportunity to make your way right over there to the I've Decided wall, as soon as this service is over, I want you to make your way over there, sign that wall, date it. It's important that you declare, today is the day I decided to follow Jesus. Others will see that and they'll want to follow Christ, but you need to make that declaration. There'll be somebody over there that'll put a book in your hand if you want it. It's entitled Now What? It'll help you with your next step in following Christ. If you need a Bible, we've got a Bible for you as well, and they're available right there as well. But uh, make sure you make your way over to the I've Decided wall and sign it, date it, declare today is the day I've decided to follow Jesus. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you for being here today and making this such a special day. I know many are going to be traveling. If you're out traveling, we pray traveling mercies upon you. But uh, come on, let's get ready and make a great week for the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you what? God bless you, everybody. Have a blessed, blessed week.